Today we are about to discuss a very important topic, very contemporary topic for developing country for the Global South, the booming startup and FDI in the Global South. Today we are honored to have Emmanuel Akoto, project manager at BSW Ghana. And he also ran his own um, startup as well in Ghana. And we also have um, Professor Kalimula from Dhaka University. He's a leading academic from Dhaka University. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, a bit of uh, this topic and why we, we would, uh, what, which area we should discuss and how, how booming startup and FDI can benefit the global south. Over the past two decades, startups around the world have rapidly transformed various industries from ride hailing that has disrupted taxi service, food delivery that may soon reduce the need for physical space of the restaurant, through to the coming of AI era that open AI and many more startups have successfully integrated AI into everyday applications. Interestingly, majority of these unicorn startups originate in developed worlds or global north, with some exceptions like countries like China and India that have homegrown a significant number of unicorns such as TikTok from China and Flipkart from India. With this trend, we are leaving many country in the global south wondering how they can emulate the success of startup turning into unicorn from developed countries emulating this success and accelerating local startup into global unicorns for several decades we have observed wave and wave of incoming fdi from the global north to the global south to reap benefits of lower cost and exploit untapped consumer markets. Recent decade, we are observing that a significant number of this FDI is now focusing on funding and acquiring potential startups in the global south. At the end of the day, many potential startups in the global south have been acquired or integrated into the larger ecosystem of unicorn or tech giants from the global north, leaving small socio-economic benefits to the country in the Global South. Therefore, the Global South should not focus on only increasing the number of startups and keeping FDI flowing from the Global North, but it's more crucial for the Global South to think about how the developing world can to really benefit from this trend. So the question to discuss today is, from your perspective, how the booming startups and FDI in the Global South can truly benefit people in the Global South. First question is, what government should do in order to re-up more benefits to the Global South? Please, who wants to start first? I'm an academician, Professor. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Well, it's a very pertinent issue, a question. Uh, we know we are uh, living in a fast changing world. Mm -hmm and uh, North-South cooperation, that framework was there. And uh, to start with, uh, if you go back to history, you find that at one point, the world was Eurocentric, then it turned into North Atlantic centric, and now, in the 21st century, it's Asia centric. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, giants like China, India, yeah. they're coming up. Mm -hmm. India is uh, the largest democracy now in the world in terms of population. And uh, China is a huge country in terms of population also. And in terms of uh, modernization drive, they have uh, almost reached the moon, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, they are quite a prudent nation. Uh, and uh, slowly but surely, they are reaching the target. And uh, 
international uh, investors, especially from the north, they have uh, invested a lot in China, in India, and compared to other mm. nations uh, in the south. And uh, lately, because of uh, the fear of China turning into a big dragon, I mean, northern countries, they are trying to rethink and uh, relocate. And uh, India is one of the favorite destinations uh, and other small mm. nations too. But again, uh, lately, uh, uh, the fallout which you have seen between uh, India and northern countries such as Canada mm -hmm. is uh, a kind of uh, sudden development. And uh, former president of the United States of America, Mr. Barack Hussein Obama, he lately in an interview gave a cautionary note to India mm -hmm. that it should sort of uh, come to senses. Otherwise, these divisive uh, factors might uh, thwart uh, the pace of development in the country. And we know about the Burma Act, mm -hmm. which has been enacted uh, by the United States of America, which uh, has all to do with the whole region, not only Myanmar or the mm -hmm. of Burma. Bangladesh, for example, is a frontline street. Uh, so is India. And, uh, you know, uh, India is a huge country again. So uh, it's a big market. Bangladesh, a sizable population, is also a big market, but not in the same state of development like India. So uh, there are a lot of potentials. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, since historically, traditionally, India and Bangladesh countries like this are uh, labor intensive country. So introduction of AI has uh, complicated the whole scenario. Uh, so uh, we need a kind of a mental revolution to cope up with uh, the Silicon Valley of India is Bangalore, the mm -hmm. south. So uh, that is kind of a model to uh, sort of uh, replicate to innovate. And uh, there may be other options as well. So we'll have to wait and see. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Please, Emmanuel, uh, please share your view on this. Uh, uh, thank you very much for being here. I'm very excited. And um, this is a very, very important topic, like Professor Alida, too, in, in our times. And we, we see that the, the reasons behind this boom in, in, in FDIs and startups in the global south is as a result of you know, several factors, but I just want to touch on three main factors. So the first one has to do with that is where growth is, is, is happening. Mm -hmm. If you look at the GDP growth rates in uh, a lot of developed countries, it's stagnant, 1%, 2%. But in countries in the developing world or in the global south, 4%. Some even double digits. Ghana, yes. for example, recorded double digit GDP growth rates in a few years back. So I think that that is where growth is happening and investors want to get high returns on their, on their money. So one of the reasons accounting for this boom. I think secondly too, because of the population growth, you mentioned India and China already having huge populations. Africa is now home to the youngest population in the world. So consumption is high. We have 70% of our population below the age of 35. Wow. So it's really, really a uh, prime to, uh, and also skilled labor, prime to receive some of these investments for, for, to spare on economic growth. Although I think um, we still haven't received much uh, we've not benefited much from the whole FDI flow, but there is some traction going on. And I think the third one is uh, um, high uh, penetration, uh, in inter internet and mobile penetration rates in the region. I mean, currently we have over 85% phone penetration rates and also technology, which can be leveraged on to also spare economic growth. So I think these are some of the reasons why we are seeing this, this boom. And if we are thinking of how governments can position themselves to be recipients of high FDIs in the global south, I think the first thing we have to look at is political stability, mm. which is very, very important. We are currently seeing a lot of coup d'etats in, in very close countries from where I'm coming from, Burkina Faso, uh, Mali, many other countries you know, are, are seeing this. And that doesn't 
uh, entice, uh, uh, you know, money from, from, from the global north. You know, so I think political stability is very, very key. And I think that the regulatory environment, very, very key. Uh, a lot of countries sometimes they change their laws and want to apply it retroactively. Mm -hmm. And so businesses go away. We had ExxonMobil come to Ghana to try and uh, go into the oil sector drill, but then they left because of some of these uh, uh, reasons. And so the regulatory environment is very, very key. And then I think thirdly, we should also look at incentives proper incentives that really uh, enhances, that makes us benefit. I think you and I were sharing how mm -hmm. some countries have even banned the exportation of some raw materials. Yes, exactly. and to, to promote uh, the local processing. Exactly, yes. yeah, yeah. In Ghana currently, Ghana is the second largest producer of cocoa in the world, next to Ivory Coast. And we export about 90% of our cocoa beans, uh -huh. which is very high. It is illegal to buy cocoa beans in Ghana. A law that was passed like 50 years ago to benefit our colonial masters wow. is still on our law books. <laughs> and it, it's, it's, it, it must change. And so we really need to put in place policies that helps drive economic growth. So for example, if uh, you want investors to rather add value to raw materials to, to in, the, in the country, it's going to create more jobs for young people. Unemployment is a big threat sure. to our national security. Aside climate change, unemployment is a big thing. Young people want jobs. And so right now we see a lot of young people in going into vices, trying to also go through dangerous routes to, to migrate to other countries. All these things can be curtailed if we can put in, in place effective policies that can really spare on economic and inclusive growth. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, I think we, we have a quite good um, overview of, of the, the way mm. forward for the government. Mm not only uh, geopolitics, but yeah. also internal yes. policies, yes. internal yes. measures exactly. that the government has mm. to, to come up with the right measures, mm. the right policies mm. to promote uh, uh, long-term benefits mm. of the local economy, not only just receiving, receiving the, the FDI mm -hmm. and increasing the number of mm. uh, startups, mm -hmm. but we also need to create a policy framework mm -hmm. that would benefit the local economy. Exactly. And from your perspective, mm -hmm. maybe we can start from mm -hmm. Emilio, mm -hmm. since you are working in a private sector yeah. and you have your own startup. Yeah. From your perspective, mm -hmm. um, from the private sector side, mm -hmm. from the startup side, mm -hmm. from the local company side, how can this entity, local entities, mm -hmm. benefit from this coming trend? Mm -hmm. they, most of them, are becoming absorbed in, mm. into the global value chain, global supply chains, mm. and absorbed into the position, the lower positions, mm. without bargaining power, mm. without value added, mm. under the control of the bigger firms yeah. in the developed world, exactly. in the global north. Exactly. How, how we can move up mm. the value chain, how can we move up in terms of creating more value mm. to local entities? Mm. Mm. I think, I think that's a very, very important uh, subject or topic as well. Uh, currently, we are seeing a lot of interest in startups across the global south. Uh, we have the likes of uh, Noskin, for example, in Rwanda. We have impact hubs across many African countries. Mm -hmm. Trying to create that environment that would give young persons or young people the space, the, the tools they need to come up with their own ideas, to start up you know, uh, new businesses. And uh, usually when it takes off, it can, you know, also create jobs and it can, you know, lead to more economic mm -hmm. growth. So I think that for, for, for startups, one of the very important things I think they can do to, you know, attract FDIs is to first of all, and know their, their USP or their unique selling proposition. Mm -hmm. What is it that they are trying to offer? What is my offering? And making sure that they understand the, the sector or the market very, very well. I think that is very, very important because uh, if you are a startup and you don't understand the dynamics of how your, your market operates, and even from a global perspective, you would, you would, you would be at a losing end at, uh, you know, in the end. So it's very important that you understand your USP and also understand the market dynamics in which you operate. I think that also, as they say, you know, it all falls down and rises on leadership. You need to have the right leadership in place the right systems in place to be able to receive, you know, such huge volumes of, of, of money. I think last year, you know, startups received about 
2.1 billion US dollars from venture capitals and, mm -hmm. and, and, and investments, you know, which is, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think pre-COVID pre and pre-Russia, Ukraine was quite high, we've, it's, it's going down, but it's beginning to pick up again. Yes. And I think that uh, startups that also can leverage on technology, very, very important, because you want to, you know, go into areas that are easily scalable, you know, businesses that can, like for example, you mentioned uh, the delivery, food deliveries, for example, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a business concept that can easily be is, is scalable. You can leverage technology to scale up. So sure. I think that startups should also look at how they can leverage on technology because of the digital world that we, we, we live in right now. You have a lot of startups, they don't have physical offices or physical presence, but they are, you know, generating huge volumes because of, of, of the use of, of, of technology. So that is also very, very important for startups. And I think that the last thing for me as a, as a, as a startup that I probably maybe should have been the first is to believe in the dream that you have because of the, of the setbacks. To have the passion. The passion, yeah. yes. You see, not, I don't think everyone is born to start a business. We say that young people should start a business. Not everyone has the tenacity, the perseverance, the determination, the skill to be able to stand a lot of obstacles you would face you know, before you position yourself to receive. Sometimes you have to sacrifice for years, and most, a lot of, you know, uh, 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 entrepreneurs... Have go through up and down. Exactly, page. yes, and then they give up in yeah. the beginning. So I think that it's very, very important to believe in the, in the dream that you have. I mean, there is not a startup example I want to give, but I was just listening to the Nobel laureates, uh, uh, persons recently, mm -hmm. and how they stood with you know, this, uh, they came up with this, uh, the COVID drug, uh -huh. and many people didn't believe in them for years and decades. They weren't hungry, but they believed in what they were doing, and now they are, they are Nobel laureates. So it, it, it spoke to me in, in volumes that you need to be dogged, believe in what you are doing, and then, you know, go with it, and in the end, I'm sure you would receive that uh, money that you are looking for to scale up. Be passionate, be yes. persistent. Exactly, yes. 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 Thank yes. you very much, mm. Emilio, yeah. to, to share your insight yeah. to uh, Startup uh, strategies, yes. startup um, actions that uh, would would help the growth. Mm. Um, Professor Kalibula, um, yes, last year we discussed about um, the supply chain and value chains. Um, I think Bangladesh is one of the leading hub for garment industry in the world. Large number of uh, FDI coming into buying and spending and investing into the local industries. That's right. But over the long run, how Bangladesh benefits from this FDI and how startup in Bangladesh would, would do to, to benefit from the mm. growing trend mm. of a global startup, mm. global startup becoming unicorn, mm. changing the, in transforming different industries. Mm. Please. Well, uh, AI, the interaction of mm. AI is revolutionizing mm -hmm. the scenario globally. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are maybe on the receiving end. So uh, if we opt for a gradual step approach, slowly, mm -hmm. surely we can adjust, re equip, and still can keep our competitive edge in the competition. We have demographic dividend, like yeah. Ghana, <laughs> of course, and uh, our young mm. boys and girls, mm. they are into IT and other sectors, and uh, traditional style uh, schooling is waning uh, in the place of the traditional style syllabus. Uh, we are incorporating uh, state of the art of us uh, in our uh, education institutions. Private sector education is coming out. Mm. We have more than 100 uh, tertiary level uh, universities in the private sector. And uh, they are competing and edge over to uh, public universities mm. in many contexts. And uh, of course, uh, the brain day, which you used to cry about, has been halted to some extent because of the flourishing 
industries and uh, also the most modern uh, technology has been introduced with reference to certain sectors. And uh, we are confident that we'll be able to cope with the rise of AI, mm. uh, robotics, mm. and other sort of uh, devices and also technologies such as uh, uh, electric, electric automobile mm. sort of industries. So uh, the reduction of the use of fossil fuel and alternative energy uh, sector can be another uh, area to explore. Uh, the use of uh, solar power, mm. for example, mm. wind power, mm. uh, even tidal boats, all these untapped uh, sort of uh, avenues can be uh, new frontiers. When I was an undergrad student in Dhaka University, I came across the work of uh, a seminal work of uh, Alvin Toffler mm -hmm. entitled The Future Shock. In the 70s, oh, wow. when you think about uh, the 21st century, I mean, a lot of things have changed. Yeah, of course, yeah, it's true. So, uh, we have a long way to go, mm -hmm. of course, and uh, we've got to have uh, the vision and uh, also all the infrastructural developments uh, has brought uh, Singapore to Dhaka, mm. for example, we have now expressway, we have uh, metro rail, uh, we have uh, newest terminals, which has been incorporated in our airport. So all this has revolutionized the scenario here on the ground. And uh, people have come to terms to live with it. It's a reality. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, mm. Professor Kalbula. Mm. Um, today we have very um, fruitful discussions mm -hmm. on this topic, the booming startup and FDI in the Global South. The key message, I think, we all agree that it's not only the booming, mm. but it's also how we, government mm -hmm. and the private sector, prepare ourselves mm -hmm. in the way that uh, we up most of the benefits from this booming. And uh, we would like to thank mm -hmm. both uh, Professor Kalimula and Emmanuel for um, get, give us very insightful uh, ideas, mm -hmm. insightful comments on this topic. And I think uh, many of you who watch it later on mm -hmm. will benefit from getting insight and getting shed light into your um, mind, your discussions. Uh, idea, give you a discussion, discuss idea about this topic. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thank you. It, thank was, you a, it was a uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah. <laughs>